I think I'm the luckiest person in the world. My office is Fenway Park's field. I get goosebumps every day I walk on the field. And that's not just because I'm allergic to grass, which I actually am, but because I have the honor and the privilege to be one of the caretakers of the hallowed, hallowed ground at Fenway Park. One of my best parts of my job is helping people create memories on the field. I grew up a baseball fanatic and played baseball growing up and received college scholarships to pitch. My grandfather played in 1902 in the majors and my dream was to follow in his footsteps and not only make it to the majors, but someday stand on Fenway Park's mound. It was difficult to see at the time, but July 10th, 1981, one month after graduating high school, was the luckiest day of my life. I was walking into a McDonald's restaurant across the parking lot and a car came off the street and hit me, threw me 20 feet in the air. I slammed into the brick wall by the entrance of the door of McDonald's and the same car came at a higher rate of speed and hit me a second time. My first thought was not only was my leg crushed, I feared my dreams were crushed. I thought, what am I gonna do? And my family raised me to believe adversity makes you stronger and inspired me to never give up. They told me how lucky I was, believe it or not, how lucky I was to use my time wisely to find a career I would love to do because so many people go through life without the joy of a job that they love. They told me that I had an opportunity to look at each challenge as a detour and not as a roadblock. I walked on crutches for two and a half years. I walked with a cane for 10 months. My surgeon told me I'd never walk normally again. But I took the, my, my inspiration from my family and took on that positive attitude. And I've had 43 surgeries, and I figure that's better than 44. I'm a big believer in celebrating life every day because you never know when that next challenge will happen. In fact, this past off season in, in the winter, I was seriously injured on a domestic airline that I'm still struggling with every day. And when my family inspired me to find a career that I'd love to do, I came up with four areas that I would love. One was a job outside because that made me happy. And two was science. I love science in school. And three was landscaping. I grew up taking care of people's lawns and enjoyed that. And four was baseball. I loved baseball. So rather than just pick one of those, I put them all together and figured someone had to be a major league groundskeeper. My brother Terry lived in Milwaukee at the time and told me if I could get a job with the Brewers, I could live with him to save money. So after many, many phone calls and letters and letters, the Brewers hired me 34 years ago and gave me an opportunity to be on their ground crew. I was thrilled. I was always honored to have the opportunity to work for the Brewers. And 19 years ago, legendary Red Sox groundskeeper, Mr. Joe Mooney, who was the groundskeeper for the Red Sox at Fenway for 30 years, called me out of the blue and said, David, I'm thinking about retiring, but I'll only retire if you replace me. What? My heart stopped. I couldn't believe it. I grew up a Red Sox fanatic. I was so honored, humbled. Chills went through me. I couldn't believe that he had called, that the Red Sox had chosen me of all people. The 19 years since, I've never taken my job for granted. I'm truly honored and humbled to have this responsibility and be part of the team to help care for this field. My job is truly the next best thing to playing, and I've made it to Fenway Park's mound. I feel truly blessed, so fortunate to have this opportunity. You know, we all face challenges in our lives, and I encourage you to celebrate each day as you go on with those opportunities. You know, if I would have given up along the way at any point, none of these challenges, uh, none of these opportunities would have happened. Not only would I have not had the opportunity to be groundskeeper here, but if all these curveballs would have been thrown at me, none of these experiences would have happened in my life either. If I never would have been hit by a car that day in July, I never would have met my incredible wife, had two amazing daughters in my life, or had the opportunity to face and overcome the adversity in my life it's helped shape me into who I am. I truly feel blessed to have the opportunity and the life that I have. I'm so fortunate.
to have that opportunity. Resiliency and groundskeeping, just like in life, is an important part of taking care of the field. We all deal with challenges in groundskeeping, whether those challenges come from Mother Nature, baseball games, or extra events. We use cutting edge science to help take science to take on those challenges. And I welcome and value the input from players and their feedback as we take on those challenges to keep the field in tip top condition. I'm very fortunate to have outstanding support throughout the organization and hard work from my crew and our vendors to keep the field in its best condition. Safety and playability is always our first priority. I remember when I sat down with Mr. Mooney in January of 2001, and we talked about how the fields are different and similar. And he said, David, if it really rains hard, the crown of the field, the dugouts will flood. And if it really, really rains hard, the storm drain system on Yawkey Way can't handle a heavy rainstorm, and the water will back up and come up through the manhole cover in the third base concourse, and the concourse will flood. And if it really, really, really rains hard, water will back up through the city drain pipes, and the first base camera pit will fill all the way to the top with water, and fish from the Charles River will swim through the city drain pipes and swim out on the field. Well, out of respect to Mr. Mooney, I just said, wow, Mr. Mooney, that's incredible. Well, fast forward, we opened uh, April at home that year on a Monday, and on Friday night before opening day, forecast was for two to three inches of rain. So we put the tarp on, and sure enough, by Saturday morning when the rain stopped, we had received close to three inches of rain. So I walked out behind home plate, along the edge of the tarp, got near first base, and there was a fish about six inches long on the edge of the grass. I looked up in the stands for Mr. Mooney, thinking he had set me up for a joke three months in advance. He was nowhere to be found. I went to the camera pit, and sure enough, it was full of water. Between the camera pit and the second base position, there were seven more fish. In the rush of getting ready for opening day, the fish were thrown away, but luckily I took a picture of them. But I wish I would have dry mounted one for his office, for my office, and for ownership. You know, speaking of ownership, they've invested over $300 million making incredible improvements at Fenway Park, including a new field that drains great so the dugouts don't flood, and it's flat so we don't have the crown, and also a new camera pit so we don't get fish on the field anymore. You know, people often ask me about the mowing patterns, how they're created, how we get the stripes in the grass. You know, any mower will make a pattern in the grass with its tires and its blades, but our mowers also have rollers on them that help bend the grass blade in the direction the mowers travel. You think of vacuuming the carpet, how it changes the nap of the uh, carpet. You know, some people think it's done with different mowing heights, paint, or if, if we use different grasses, but it's really just the direction the mower travels. So a light stripe or section goes away from you and a dark section comes toward you. So it can be a traditional checkerboard, something festive like a flag for flag day as you see on the video board, or a Red Sox logo. However, growing up a Red Sox fanatic myself and being an Ohio State Buckeye grad, there are two patterns I suggest you don't do. That would be a Yankee logo or a Michigan logo, because I think those would kill the grass. But for those homeowners out there who love their lawn, I encourage you to use your imagination, mow like a pro, and have fun. You know, weather dictates so much of what we do. Other than looking at my wife and Drago first thing in the morning and last thing at night, is I look at weather all day long. It dictates so much of what we do. And weather technology over my 34-year career has improved vastly. We have two weather services that we can call throughout the day for up-to-date forecast. We have some really cool apps that we can use on our smartphones and our iPads one of which is called Radar Scope that gives us up-to-date radar Im images. And so we can use this information to communicate with the umpires. The goal of the game is always to get nine innings in, and once again, safety and playability. So I'll get up-to-date forecasts in between innings uh, when the game's going on and go out to see the umpire during a rain game, take the iPad out to show them up-to-date uh, radar loops. And that helps with safety and playability when the tarp goes on or when we're using drying agent. Another part of weather we deal with is snow. Snow is a great insulator. It keeps the frost from going as deep, but um, timing is everything with snow. If it gets too close to opening day, we'll actually have to plow it off. And then there's the risk of damaging the turf. Five of the last seven years I worked for the Brewers, it snowed the night before opening day. 
But if it's within a few days to a week before opening day, we'll actually spread black sand over top of the snow. And black sand will absorb heat from the sun. It's called the albedo effect. And we can melt up to six to 12 inches a day of snow. And then once that snow is gone, the black sand falls into the grass, acts as a top dressing, and actually warms up the grass to help it uh, grow in the spring. You know, the infield skin, where the infielders stand, is that engineered soil. We don't call it infield dirt because in, I think of dirt as what people get on their clothes. Infield skin is an engineered mix that's carefully designed out of percent sand, silt, and clay. There's actually five types of sand. Fine, very fine, medium, coarse, and very coarse. Think of marbles in a jar. They're all big marbles or very coarse pieces of sand. It's going to be unstable underneath the player's feet. And if they're all very fine, it's going to lock up tight and get very hard. What we strive for is for it to be like a cork board so that we build it so that it's engineered so the majority of the sand particles are in the medium part of the sand, sand spectrum. So we strive for it to be just like a firm, firm footing, but yet resilient for ball bounce and for firm footing. We also combine that with water. So how we water depends on weather. Sun, wind, dew point, humidity, cloud cover, wind, wind chill, frost, all factor in to how we water. But once again, safety and playability and player feedback all play into that. You know, the Green Monster is a historic part of Fenway Park. And I certainly knew about it growing up a Red Sox fan, but it wasn't until I had the privilege and honor of working at Fenway and seeing it up close that I realized how magical it really is. The top part of the wall was resurfaced in 1976. So all the balls that have hit the top of the wall hard since then have left an imprint into the wall that I call dimples. If you look at it in the morning or in the evening, the light catches it, it looks like a golf ball and it's textured. And Stan Grossfeld, an award-winning article, a writer and photographer for the Boston Globe, wrote a really fun article in August of 2014 when he tried to calibrate how many balls have hit the monster since then. And the bottom part of the wall, when the ball hits, leaves its own signature mark where you may see the red seam marks or even the ink coming off the ball where it leaves a partial to a full imprint of the MLB logo to the word Rawlings that's on the ball to even the fine signature of Major League Baseball commissioner. So it's fascinating. It has its own imprint that I call baseball tattoo or fingerprint of Fenway because no two are alike. You know, I hope you've taken some uh, interesting tips from today's talk away, and I hope you'll make time to celebrate life every day because you never know how quickly it'll change. You know, a baseball saying I use to inspire me every day is called one base at a time, and I encourage you to make time to take action to celebrate life every day. Thank you all so much. So, you know, in closing, I'm really glad your brother took you in uh, at the Brewers and um, you know, I know he couldn't be here today, uh, and you wanted to say goodbye to him in an appropriate way, but he was an inspiration for you, and you're an inspiration to so many. Um, thank you so much, and uh, any final thoughts? Well, I just, I'm humbled to have the opportunity to be here. You know, my brother did pass away. You know, I, uh, he, lived, he and his wife lived on a, a lake south of Milwaukee, and my family would go visit him and have wonderful times together. And we said our normal goodbyes on July weekend in 1998. Well, I'll see you later and gave each other a hug. Two nights later, my sister-in-law called and said, Terry's gone. And I said, where did he go? And he said he had passed away. And there's so many things I wish I had told him. How much I loved him, thanked him for all his love and sacrifices. And I just got caught up living my busy life. And I encourage you all to make time to reach out to your loved ones today and often and learn from my mistake. Great. Well, thank you. All right.